Well, hello, this is the Green Corn Rebellion Show. I'm Gregory Hurd II. Today, I am here with uh, Kimberly Graham, who is running for the Senate, the U.S. Senate, against Joni Ernst in Iowa. Um, welcome. Hey, good to be here. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, so, could you tell me a little bit about your childhood and where you're from? Yeah, so I was born at Camp Pendleton Marine Corps Base, which is in Oceanside, California. My dad is one of 11 siblings from here in the middle of Iowa, central Iowa area. And he went out to live with an older brother um, who was living in Southern California when he was about 16. He joined the Marines. And then several years later, uh, I was born. Well, he finished high school, then joined the Marines. Then I was born. Um, and then uh, about 27 years ago, um, I moved back to Iowa to go to Drake Law School and uh, raise my son. And so lived in Indianola, which is a little bit south of Des Moines for 25 years, and then now I've moved to the south side of Des Moines for the last almost two years. All right, cool. Uh, what made you want to become a lawyer? Huh. Um, I think, so So my dad uh, and my mom both barely graduated high school. Um, my mom was a teenage mother when she had me, and uh, I certainly... Um, did not grow up with any expectation that I would be going to college, let alone law school. There's no one in my extended family who has a college, you know, who had college degree. I did have one aunt who went to college, um, but it just wasn't really, um, yeah, it just was, wasn't really an expectation, I guess, in my family. I'm not sure what was. Um, I think my parents, like a lot of people, were just trying to kind of get by in their lives. They were lucky. They did both get good union jobs. So, you know, uh, my parents divorced when I was about 13, but until I was 13, um, you know, we had a two income, two union wage income household. So we were okay. And we had health insurance and all that kind of stuff. Um, go unions. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I've seen firsthand how important unions are. Uh, but, um, and I myself worked as a union flight attendant for 13 years while I put myself through college and law school uh, and was a volunteer union organizer. So, um, you know, I, I didn't I, I was just trying to get a bachelor's degree. I, I had just read, had been told that probably you're going to have a little bit easier financial life if you go to college. And that's certainly not always true. But I didn't. I just did okay in school in high school, and we went to a field trip to a university, uh, like a busload of kids. They took us to this university when I was in high school, and I, you know, got off that bus and walked onto that college campus, and and just for me, with not even really knowing anyone very well who had gone to college except that one aunt, um, that was just like a magical place for me, and. And I wanted to go. So I, you know, found college applications and filled them out on my own and <laughs> just kind of made my way there. Um, and then after law school, I'm sorry, after college, um, I actually in my last year or two of getting my bachelor's degree decided that I really wanted to be a doctor. Long story of why I decided I want to be a doctor. But by then, it took me almost nine years to get a bachelor's degree because I had to work the whole time and work and then go back to school and then stop stop school for a little while and work more and, you know, to, to get by. And so I was nine years after high school is when I got my bachelor's degree. It took me that long. And by then I was 27, 20, something like that. And I knew that I also wanted to be a mom. I really, you know, some people don't, but I really wanted to have a child. And I was 27 years old and really wanted to be a doctor. But I was looking at another like 10 to 15 years of school beyond that. And I didn't want to be in medical school and in residency and be trying to raise a very young child. So I just looked around, like literally, I looked around what I want to help people. What 
what can I do that that will help people and hopefully make a good enough living that I won't be living in poverty? I mean, that was, that was kind of my criteria. So um, I had by then just met my son's father. Um, unfortunately, we divorced when my son was about seven, but I had met him and he had just finished law school here at Drake University in Des Moines. And, you know, he said, why don't you take the LSAT and, you know, see if you can get into law school. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I did. And I studied for, I took a course and studied for the LSAT for like a month and took it and did pretty well um, and got into law school and decided that I wanted to practice, for the most part, the kinds of law that really help people with like real everyday problems. And so that's how I became a lawyer. It wasn't, you know, I, I think that story actually is fairly common. I don't think I don't think that's very many people who sort of plot out their life, you know, starting at some certain age. And it's great if you know what you want to do when you're in high school or even when you're in your college years. But I didn't know. I just knew that um, I hated injustice. You know, all my growing up, I had this things would ping my injustice meter and really make me mad. And I never understood why all these horrible things happen and how, uh, what I would read about, and I'm lucky that I was reading about it. I wasn't experiencing it. I mean, maybe a little bit as a woman, but you know, certainly as a middle income white girl, I wasn't experiencing it. But when I would read about other people being discriminated against mm -hmm. and about the civil rights movement and about how Native Americans have been treated in our history and on and on, I, all of that stuff growing up, when I would read about it, would just infuriate me and, and make me angry and sad and I'd cry and get really upset. And so in retrospect, it seems kind of like, of course, I would end up becoming a lawyer for kids, but it, you know, I didn't. It wasn't like a well thought out plan at the time. I just have always kind of done the next thing in front of me, I guess. <laughs> All right. That's cool. Um, so what made you want to run to be senator of Iowa? Yeah, well, again, uh, I've never thought I would run for office. I, I certainly didn't have some grand plan to ever be in politics. Um, I think there were several things that kind of the perfect storm kind of all came together around the same time. So the first thing would be that like a lot of us, I sat there, you know, in my jam jams on election night in 2016 on my bed watching the election returns roll in and just literally, literally sitting there with my mouth open. Mm -hmm. Even though I have to tell you that sadly, I was telling my friends in January of 2016 that this was probably going to happen and I was serious. I wasn't joking around and all my friends were saying, no way, no way, it's <laughs> never going to happen. Oh, look at the polls. And I'm like, you're not hearing and seeing what I'm hearing and seeing because I'm telling you this is really, really probably going to happen. <laughs> but even so, I was still hoping I was wrong, but I wasn't, uh, unfortunately. And so that happened. And then my son was a uh, junior in high school when that election happened. And um, so he would be leaving home in like a year and a half to go off and do his own thing. And um, that election happened. And I've spent almost 20 years, well, 17 or 18 years at that time, um, doing a few different kinds of law, but primarily representing abused kids in the Iowa courts and representing parents in the juvenile court system, parents who more, most often had addiction issues, mental health issues, um, and a lot of all of that brought on by their own childhoods in poverty and by their own poverty, you know, and lack of education and just all these multiple things that create the situations where people find themselves in juvenile court and having their children removed from their care. Um, and I've spent now almost 20 years seeing with my own eyeballs what happens when you don't invest in your people, when you have a country that as a rule doesn't invest in, in the majority of its people, but instead invests in the very already wealthy, instead gives tax subsidies to people that don't need them <laughs> and just makes the rich richer and the rich richer and the rest of us, you know, 
we might put a Band-Aid on some of the problems and put Band-Aids on some of the symptoms, but we don't, we're not addressing the root causes of poverty. We're not addressing the root causes of so many issues in our culture. So I've seen that for 20 years. 2016 election happens. My son's about, you know, year and a half away from leaving home or so. And I saw like an ad or somebody emailed me something. I don't remember exactly. I think it might've been on Facebook. I saw this thing for ready to run, which is like a boot camp for women who want to run for office or who are thinking about running for office. So I went up to the Chapman Katz Center for Women in Politics, which is at the um, Iowa State University in Ames, which is about 45 minutes north of here in Des Moines. Um, and I went to like one day in January or February and one day the next month and one day the next month of like a, it was like a three day boot camp over three months of just kind of a high level. If you're thinking of running for office, here's kind of what introductory stuff, what you would need to know and what you would need mm -hmm. to do. And, and I didn't know until the first day of that boot camp. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I just knew I had to do something. Um, like I said, the other day or a couple nights ago, I think it was at the Cedar Rapids Climate March. Um, I said, you know, I see I see all these problems in our country and I have a 20 year old son. And for you parents, you know, out there, you will know exactly what I mean when I say I would do anything to help my son. I would do anything to save my son and save his future, including running for United States Senate. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, um, and that's true. It was like this, like I said, all these different things together and and my son and, you know, you and your friends and your parents. And I just don't see a lot of people out there stepping up to run for public office because I'll tell you something, it is um, really hard. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to, I mean, it's not like backbreaking labor, but it's exhausting. And, to, you know, to have a chance of winning, you, you're working 15, 17 hours a day, which is roughly what I've been working every day since May, because I still work for money on top of work, mm -hmm. you know, campaigning. And you mostly, the way our current system is set up, you mostly spend a lot of time calling people that you don't know and asking them for a lot of money to yeah. fund your campaign because that's the way we do it in this country. And I don't know one person who really likes calling people and asking them for money, who likes doing that, nobody. Um, so, you know, the actual running, the actual meeting people and talking to people and listening to people, that's awesome. But there's a whole lot about the back scenes, you know, behind the scenes that most people never see that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not super fun. <laughs> <laughs> But I just felt like I can make the time to do it. Not not a lot of, not very many people can make the time to do it. You know, right. if I wasn't lucky enough that, that, you know, I have a job situation where I could make the time to do it, if I wasn't lucky enough that, um, for instance, I, I could not do this financially if I had not moved in with my fiancé. So I was able to, you know, I, I, um, well, me and the bank, <laughs> I don't own it free and clear, but I own a home. Well, me and the bank own a home. Um, and I've rented out my home because and moved in with my fiance. So I don't have, you know, I don't have that mortgage payment while I'm running for office. If I hadn't been able to do that, I wouldn't have financially been able to run for office. I, um, <laughs> I'm not excited about it. But of the candidates in Iowa on the Democrat side running for U.S. Senate, I'm pretty sure I by far have the lowest net worth, like I have net worth. Um, and, you know, while I don't love the fact that that's true, and that's primarily true because of student loan debt, I have massive amounts of student loan debt. I think that it's about time we have more representatives representing us <laughs> who are more like most of us, you know, and businesses are great. And, you know, making money ethically is great. But I just don't think we need more business people yeah. representing us in Congress. And I think we need more people who have a demonstrated history of doing a substantial amount of public service already behind them, 
before they get to Congress or they get to the Senate. I mean, there's something like two lobbyists for every one person in Congress, I believe. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So there's more than enough people representing the interests of businesses and corporations in, in Congress. Uh, and, and we need to start fixing that, you know. So all of those reasons like together are why I, I just I decided to run. And then I went to that boot camp thing and I just literally looked around. OK, who what's what's up? Like what you know, who's up for reelection and when in my state? <laughs> and I saw that Joni Ernst was up for re-election like two years, you know, into the future at that point. Um, no, no, be four years. It was yeah. four years into the future at that point. And I thought, OK, you know, that gives me some time to <laughs> try to, to like pay off some debt and, you know, try to situate my life so that I could afford to do it. And um yeah, and then I just I just decided to do it. I, I'm really inspired by Tom Harkin. He was our senator in mm -hmm. Iowa for 30 years, and before yeah. that, 10, 10 more years in Congress. And he started his career at Legal Aid, and so did I. I started as a summer intern at Iowa Legal Aid, and I, you know, most of us in Iowa feel quite fondly about Tom Harkin because he really, we all felt, and I believe is true, is accurate. We felt that he was there to serve people. He wasn't there because he cared about power or money or whatever. Mm -hmm. He was there to try to make people's lives better. And he did. He stood up for human rights all over the world. He um, was the main architect of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which rev was revolutionary in changing people's lives in this country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he stood up for children. He stood up for elders. He he, he was just amazing. And um so that's that's kind of my inspiration is Tom Harkin. And I always tell people, you know, I'm, I'm coming to get Tom Harkin's seat back. Uh, it's really the people of Iowa's seat, but they know what I mean when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, well, um, can you tell me about your plan for the farming and agricultural community in Iowa? Yeah, well, um, that would take like hours and hours. So I'll just give you the really quick version. <laughs> so <laughs> essentially what has been happening, there's kind of several pieces to this here. What's been happening is massive corporations have been buying up land as it's become more and more difficult for farmers to make a living. A lot of them have been forced to sell off their land. And then these big corporations come in and buy up land that used to be owned by like small and medium sized farms, like more mm -hmm. like family type farms. Yeah. So these corporations now are owning, you know, a huge percentage of the farmland. I just read the, the actual number the other day and now I can't recall it, but it's, it's a huge percentage of all the farmland in Iowa is now owned by basically like corporations. And the farm bills, so, you know, every, these farm bills come out, right, of Congress. And unfortunately, though, these farm bills are often, from from my reading of them anyway, and my understanding, they're basically a way to subsidize and incentivize big corporations. These farm bills don't really support farmers, like what we think of as farmers, like family yeah. farmers, you know, people that, that that they own their land and they farm their land and they make a, 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 an okay, you know, they can get by, they make a living off the farming. Um, that kind of farm that I'm referring to is a, a vanishing thing and it shouldn't be. And until we start breaking up those those conglomerates until until we start enforcing antitrust legislation or and uh, creating more antitrust legislation using the antitrust legislation we already have enforcing it because our attorney general's office isn't doing that basically yeah. now at all um we need to start creating a more level playing field for farmers because right now they've got maybe one or two or maybe three corporations that control um, what are called the inputs and outputs. So they're controlling everything from the cost of the seed, the fertilizer, all the way up to like controlling the price that the farmer gets on the other end for when they go to sell their commodities. So <laughs> farming for so many farmers now has become basically a nonprofit enterprise. Well, that's not sustainable. Um, <laughs> and the farmers have been kind of reduced to being you know, serfs on their own land because yeah. they don't really have control over what's going on uh, on any level, really. Uh, and then on top of that, 
add the ridiculous trade wars and then add the climate crisis, yeah. you know, like their fields are flooded last spring. They couldn't plant a lot of farmers in Iowa couldn't plant, you know, some percentage of their fields in some cases. Um, and right now, I mean, I've just been driving all over the state the last couple of days. I was in Cedar Rapids two days ago or yesterday, whenever it was. And I'm driving by all these fields. It's December 8th. And there is like 20% of the corn left in the fields right now. That shouldn't still be there. Yeah. That should be harvested by this time. And the fields got so um, wet and then muddy and it's mm -hmm. warmer right now than it typically is this time yeah. of the year. And so they can't get their equipment out there. The equipment's too heavy. And so they can't go out and finish harvesting a lot of that corn. Some of that corn may just sit there and, and it, it's, it's gonna be lost. Um, you know, farmer suicides in Iowa are up. Farm bankruptcies are up. Um, it, it's it's not. It, it's a quite dire situation. And so, you know, if we start getting more people into the House of Representatives and into the U.S. Senate, who are actually out there advocating <clears throat> to create a sustainable agricultural economy in this country and in Iowa, in my case specifically we can subsidize and incentivize that. We can incentivize um, sustainable and regenerative agricultural practices to help farmers do the things that so many of them I think would really love to do. I mean, that's what I hear out there, but they can't afford to do it, especially not right now with, they're just, <laughs> they don't have two dimes to rub together in some cases. They, you know, Iowa farmers, and I think farmers in this whole country are extremely creative, extremely resourceful, they just need a level playing field. They just need a chance. And yeah. they don't even have a chance right now. Um, it's it's just really, really sad. But if but we can, instead of subsidizing and incentivizing like, you know, Pioneer Hybrid or, you know, Monsanto or whatever, you know, these big, huge companies, if we took that money away, the money they don't need, and, you know, tried to incentivize and subsidize sustainable agricultural practices, that works and not only will it create a profitable situation for the farmer but it combats the climate crisis because those are methods of farming that don't harm the environment you know they actually regenerate and preserve the environment like rotating different crops and using cover crops planting marshes and like wetlands around the edges of fields so that you're filtering out, you know, any of the, you know, you're filtering out some of the, the damaging chemicals that cut that mm -hmm. are coming off of the fields. Those are all, there's so, so many things that can be done to help the environment and help the farmer. But that's not what's being supported. That's not what's being incentivized. So. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, so what is your plan for what you'd like to see happen in our education system? Mm -hmm. Okay, so first, we have to take a really, really long, hard look at under-resourced schools because education is supposed to be somewhat, at least, somewhat of an equalizer, right? The idea, hopefully, is that it doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter what your economic background, if you were born in poverty or you were born middle income or you were born wealthy, you should be able to get a good public education in this country that then prepares you to be able to go stand on your own two feet financially and at least make a, a, an OK living. And then to, to also just side note, we need to pay people a lot more in this country, no matter what kind of work they're doing. You know, I'm in favor of it, at least a $15 an hour minimum wage index for inflation. But, but that's a side note. But it's important. So, but we've got all these schools. As long as we're paying for schools through proper local property taxes, which is how we fund our schools, then if you have the dumb luck of being born in a really poor neighborhood, well, then your school's not going to be as resourced. It's not going to get as much money funding as somebody who lucked out and got born into a, a, a higher property tax neighborhood. So. We have to find a way, and I don't know what the answer is, but I'm going to try to find it if I get to the U.S. Senate, 
uh, whether that's making up the shortfalls with federal funds, maybe that's what we do, but we have to find a way of equalizing, start out by equalizing the funding because we simply have no parity in funding. So we've got some schools that, for example, don't have any money for an orchestra, don't have any money for, you know, and then another school has all the things, right? They have an orchestra and a band and they have fine arts and they have chorus and they have, uh, you know, uh, every kind of extracurricular fun, you know, interesting thing you could have. And then these other schools like can barely provide math and reading classes and they've got leaky ceilings and ripped up textbooks and, you know, it's just, it's a mess at those schools. And and the teachers and staff at those schools, I have no doubt. I mean, I'm a very proud product of public schools. So I'm like the big, and so is my son. I'm a big public school cheerleader. I have no doubt that the vast majority of teachers and staff at those schools are doing their level best, but you can't give them nothing to work with, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and there's so many kids who, might not connect with academia they might not be great at math or they might not like math or they might not be so great at reading but maybe they would be amazing at the cello Mm -hmm. right but there's no orchestra there maybe the cello would be like their their way of connecting with community because then they would be in an orchestra and then they would have a whole sense of community with the orchestra and that would like open up their world to all these other opportunities but if we're not providing all of those opportunities for every single child in the United States of America, then I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> but we need to do that. So I think it starts with trying to equalize the funding. Definitely, you know, I agree with a lot of the people running for president that say that we should be paying teachers more. And again, if we have to equalize those funds somehow with federal funds, then maybe that we need to do that. I don't know what the answers are budget-wise without, you know, digging into the research and the numbers. But we talk a good game in this country about how important teachers are (laughs) Mm -hmm. and then in a lot of places like for instance a few years ago a couple years ago in iowa our iowa legislature um gop dominated iowa legislature cut the legs out from uh, collective bargaining yeah so we're saying well you know we're not going to let you collective bargain basically you know got the unions but oh, teachers are super important. <laughs> well, it's, you know, if you think they're so important and you respect them, then you pay them and you give them the rights to collective bargain and all the other things that they deserve as professionals that they are. So, yeah. Okay. What would you like to do in order to combat climate change? Mm. So, um, we have to do everything yesterday. Unfortunately, <laughs> yesterday has already passed. So, you know, I'm joking around, but it's not a joking matter. It really is not. Um, so I, I believe that the Green New Deal is a really excellent framework. I think that that, you know, we've got to start somewhere and we've got to really be aggressive about it. I was just reading today or yesterday, um, a little kind of little short essay type thing from a friend of mine on Facebook who was 10 years old when World War II broke out. She was, it was yesterday because she was writing it because it was uh, Pearl Harbor Day yesterday. And she was talking about how her name's Hazel Zimmerman. She's amazing. Um, She's, I think, in her mid to late 80s now. Um, And she was writing about her memories of that day and how she remembers huddling around the radio and listening to, you know, that we've been attacked, Pearl Harbor. And -hmm. and she remembers the next few years of virtually everyone, everyone making sacrifices to behind the war effort, right? So that we could win that war. Um, And, you know, Everything from, she was saying, people would even save, like, people would find, like, um, any steel or iron or stuff around their house. And, like, even, like, wrappers, like, metal, metallic candy, like, gum wrappers. Mm -hmm. They would take everything like that, and they would take it, like, to their rail yard or to some community site where they would donate it to go, to be melted, to make, you know, ammunition and to, for the war. And during that time, interestingly... We had universal child care in this country. We had a universal child care program because most of the, you know, childbearing age men were off at war and the women had to go work and do the jobs they left to go to war. 
So we had like a far better childcare system then that was subsidized heavily by the government so that so that women who had to go to work could afford it. But um, the point was that everyone pulled together. Everyone understood how important that war effort was. And I was talking to my son earlier today about this and about Hazel's little essay and all that. And, and he said, my son who's 20 said, mama, you have to start talking about that every time you talk to people and tell them about that and say, this is that. Mm -hmm. This is our World War II, and we might not have somebody dropping bombs on us, but if we don't start all pulling together in making sacrifices, which a lot of people don't want to hear, right? But, but if we can't start all doing that, we are... It's not, there's not going to be a good outcome here. There's not going to be a good outcome here. And we're going to have so much horrific so many horrific things on our doorstep uh you know climate refugees when yeah. people can no longer even live where they live right they're being flooded out they can't grow food there it's too hot there they're going to be you know literally at the doors of every country that is still hab you know, habitable right where, where mm. you can still live what are we going to i mean that's going to increase the chances of conflict increase potentially wars and and unrest and you know it's just um yeah, it, it's really an all hands on deck moment. And I believe that the Green New Deal is at least a good framework for what we, the United States, must start doing immediately. Um, and then hope that we get a president in 2020 who, you know, don't just hope though, you know, go work and volunteer and knock doors and all that, but, mm -hmm. but we can also hope um, that we get a president who is a states stateswoman or statesman who is going to go and reach out to all of the other nations of the world and say we all need to be all worked working on this because we are all on this you know giant blue marble together and if we don't it's going to be bad for all of us you know the united mm -hmm. states is just one piece of the puzzle but i i um I like the goals and the timetables of the Green New Deal. We probably need to even be trying to improve on the goals that are set in, in that. But it's a good framework. So I think that's where we start. All right. Um, so I know you support criminal justice reform. Could you tell me what are the, some of the things you'd like to do in order to reform our criminal justice system? Yeah. Oh, boy. So... <laughs> <laughs> So I haven't done criminal uh, defense work in a number of years. I used to do some um, court appointed criminal defense work earlier in my career, but I haven't done any for a while. But so just to say that I've seen up close, like in personal, what, you know, as an attorney, as a defense attorney, what goes on. Um, so there's, there's a, like it, like every other issue, there's a lot of different pieces, moving pieces to this. I mean, one of them, which, which isn't talked about a lot, but is starting to get talked about more and more, is we need to elect prosecutors. So the district attorneys, they either call them DAs in some places or yeah. um, county attorneys, they call them in other state, you know, it depends on where you live. But the people that are the head of the prosecutor's office in, in any given county, those people have, in a lot of cases, a lot of leeway in oh, yeah. how they how they administer their own prosecutions in that county in, in the United States. So we need to start really, I think, paying a lot more attention to who gets elected to those positions, because as far as I know, those are always elected positions. Somebody yeah. has to run for those. And the more that we start changing that and getting uh, to shorthand it, I guess, more uh, criminal justice reform minded or progressive people into those positions, then they will start changing the way those departments are run. Um, but to, to add to that, I mean, I believe that we also need to decriminalize marijuana on a federal scale um, and legalize medical marijuana on a federal scale. You know, here in Iowa, unfortunately, we keep sort of uh, piecemealing the medical marijuana thing. It's ridiculous. Um, I have a close family member who ha lives with chronic pain and is actually disabled, like legally disabled. He's on uh, social security disability. Um, and that would help him so much. And he would not have to be on uh, opioid type painkillers, you know, if he had access to medical marijuana. And Iowa sort of keeps 
making these very small, almost meaningless <laughs> incremental, uh, like they finally approved CBD oil, but then they oh, approved yeah. it to have a percentage that isn't actually effective for a lot of oh, people wow. for a lot of different causes or a lot of different uh, applications that they need it for. So, um, so we we did definitely need to do that, and I would, and we also need to expunge the records, you know, the criminal records of anybody who is sitting in prison or or in jail for for those for any kind of marijuana related uh, crime as well. But we we need to make sure that there are no such things as private prisons in this country. I, I you know we shouldn't be profiting. Somebody shouldn't be like. <laughs> getting wealthy off of somebody's incarceration that you know incarceration should be in my opinion a, a last resort right i mean if we feel like we can't keep that person from harming other people yeah. then we incarcerate them and separate them from the rest of the community at large um i think we could have a lot better prison diversion programs, you know, that really provide a lot of services and education to people to try to keep them in the community if they are not violent, you know, violent offenders. Um, because I, I think, oh, and, and we need to be actually helping people with mental illness in this country, because one of the, if not the biggest provider of mental health services, and they're not very good, is prisons in this yeah. country and these people who have mental illness often end up in prisons and they that's not at all where they should be <laughs> they should be uh in some kind of you know community housing supportive housing or whatever the level of care is that they need to you know the minimum sort of minimally restrictive you know whatever the minimally restrictive placement would be that would keep them safe, that would keep the community safe. Although in, in many, many, many cases, people with mental illness are not a harm to the community at all. If anything, they're harmful to themselves just because they they can't maintain themselves <clears throat> in the community. But um, the mental health system and, and care in this country is just off the chain appalling. It is It is so bad and we don't spend enough money. We don't have enough resources. We're not training enough people to provide mental health treatment. That all needs to be looked at really carefully as well as part of, you know, ironically, <laughs> criminal justice reform, just because there's so many people in the criminal justice system that really shouldn't be there. If they have mental illness, they're, you know, that's, that's their main problem. All right. So the last question is, who is your favorite music artist? And if you don't have one, you can name a couple. Okay. Um, so the first one that comes to mind is Prince. Okay. <laughs> um, I was, uh, kind of, <clears throat> interestingly, I, I mean, of course, like everybody, I mean, I knew, I knew of a lot of his music, but I had just started kind of getting into a lot of his music right around the time that he ended up, you know, passing away a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, kind of during that time period and then you know in the few years after his death I've listened to a lot more of his music than I ever had before oh man and it, it's almost like and then I was totally kicking myself for never having gone to a live show because everybody yeah. that I've ever talked to that says that says did you ever see him live I'm like no and they're like oh you know it's like you missed out and you know of course you can watch YouTube videos of it but it's totally not the same as yeah. you know being in the same room um but he was just absolutely re truly really I believe a musical genius just absolutely and not just that but just a phenomenal entertainer just amazing um and then there's just a lot of there's a lot of different people that I, I appreciate for different reasons. Um, there's a lot of uh, Sarah Bareilles songs that I really like. Um, I like some good, you know, car dancing pop tunes sometimes, like, you know, good old Taylor Swift or whatever. <laughs> um, I like a lot of jazz. I like there's even a few country songs. I'm not a giant country fan of like all country music, but there's a lot of country songs I like. Um, I like classical music. Uh, I was just kind of lucky that I just kind of grew up listening to all kinds of mm -hmm. just whatever I like to listen to. And um, so, yeah, but if I, I guess if I was forced to just pick like one, um, it would probably have to be Prince. 
And I often think about, I often wonder if he were still alive today, what he would be thinking about all this stuff that's gone on since his death. And I'm almost, (laughs) I think he might, you know, he didn't often talk directly about politics, but I think if he were still here, he might be talking today. (laughs) (laughs) He might be having a few words to say. (laughs) Uh, Yes. Uh, Are you familiar with the band Slipknot? They're from Iowa. Uh-huh, yeah, are you a uh-huh. fan of their music? Yeah, um, I'm trying to think right now. I mean, I, I think I've heard some of their songs. I can't think of them off the top of my head. I don't, are they a heavy metal band? Yes. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I appreciate heavy metal, but it's just <laughs> not, I guess this is like, I'm just so old and boring. Like, I like songs you can like, like that have like a melody you can sing. Mm-hmm. And so while I appreciate the talent that it takes to produce heavy metal music, it's just not always the most like aesthetically pleasing to my eardrums, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, is that your favorite band? Oh, oh, one of them. Definitely in my top ten or so. Yeah. Like their their lead singer, Corey Taylor, he was a Bernie supporter in twenty sixteen. Ah. That was pretty cool for me whenever I would grown up being a fan of theirs and then he endorsed my preferred candidate for president. And I was like, yeah. oh my God, so cool. Maybe there, sometime, maybe he might come and endorse you sometime because he's awesome. still, yeah, so. Very yeah. cool. Who else do you like? What, who else do you like? I like, uh, Eminem is my favorite artist of all time. Yeah. Um, Linkin Park, uh, Limp Bizkit, Korn, Lady Gaga, stuff like that, you know. Um, Did Linkin Park do, okay, this, I know, roll your eyes, you can roll your eyes, go ahead, go ahead, roll your eyes, it's okay. Did they do some of the music for those um, Transformers. The vampire movies? The vampire no, 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 no. They did the Transformer movies. The oh, new, the Transformer yeah. movies, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My son liked those Transformer movies, so maybe that's where I've heard some of their music before. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Awesome, cool. Well, well th- what made you get into, what made you want to do a show about politics? Um, cause I've always been involved with, uh, well, not always been involved, but always been interested in politics and history and stuff like that and got more involved and interested in it once I got older, once I was like a junior in high school, um, and senior in high school, my senior year was, uh, 2015, 2016. So that's Uh when Bernie Sanders started running for president and Uh I was paying really close attention to that and, then I went to college, and then Trump got elected, and then, um, <laughs> you know, I I wanted to, I started my show because, uh, you know, I felt like I had something to say, or I uh, had an objective that I wanted to uh, be able to get across. I wanted to be able to talk to candidates like you who are running out in rural red states, yeah. who were progressive. Because I'm someone who lives out in a rural red state who's also progressive. Uh, I feel like that's a point of view that needs to be talked about. Yeah. And yeah. So that was that's kind of my uh, reason for starting a show. Cool. Well, you do know, though, I do have to tell you, though, I was not a red state. We're Wait, a, that's that's we're, true. More of a we're a purple state. state. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We are like a quintessential swing state. We're one of those states that candidates keep coming to because they might be able to swing us one way or the other so well, as I always like to say to people when the, you know Iowa went Obama Obama Trump yeah. and everybody and sometimes we'll have like a Democratic senator and then a Republican governor okay right mm-hmm. the same pool of people yeah. elected and so I always tell people don't try to figure out Iowa voters okay yeah, well, this Oklahoma is the thing. that way there's two Oklahoma was that way for some years too, long before I was alive. Like back in the 80s, I think we had Republican senator, Democratic senator, and then like we'd have a Republican governor, and then like a Democrat for eight years. And it's so yeah, Oklahoma was like that before it came, became completely red. Over red. The last yeah, time. completely <laughs> red. Yeah. And I think the way that you win Iowa is the way that Obama won Iowa, and it's the way where there's no shortcut. You have to drive all around the state over and over and over and over again and literally walk into the Casey's and shake people's hands and talk to them and, more importantly, listen to them. 
Iowans, we're so used to having a, you know, presidential candidates literally in our neighbor's kitchen and talking to them and sitting down with them and meeting with them that we expect the people who are wa wanting to represent us to come physically show up in our town and talk to us, even if they're running for president, even if they're running for United States Senator, doesn't matter. So we have 99 counties in the state of Iowa and we've already been to 54 of them and we're planning to hit all 99 before hopefully, uh, probably not with the holidays, probably not December, but hopefully into January, we'll hit all 99 for the first time. And then we're gonna do it all again two more times before the June primary. So we're gonna do three full tours of the state. Um, and 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 it's, it's just what you have to do. But I, more than that, it's what you should do. I oh, think yeah. if you are telling people you want to listen to them, the way you campaign is likely the way you're going to govern. And so I'm campaigning the way I hope to be a US Senator, which is, you know, they say you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. You should listen twice as much as you talk. <laughs> and I think if you want to be a U.S. Senator, that's a really good rule to think about or a good, you know, frame of mind to be in is it's way more important to listen to people. Sure, at the end of the day, then you have to take everything you hear and go advocate for the things that will help the people in your state live lives of health and dignity. But you have to listen first to know what they need and you can't assume what people need. Sometimes you can assume a lot of things and you find out you're wrong. Maybe they needed something differently than you think, than you think given your own ex life experiences. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to come on the show. Oh, um, thank you. So uh, what's your, where can we find you on social media and what's your campaign website? So um, we are on Twitter. It's at Kimberly for Iowa. And we are on uh, Facebook, Kimberly for Iowa, Facebook page. And then our website is KimberlyforIowa.com. <laughs> so it's Kimberly for Iowa everywhere, pretty much. Yep. All right. Uh, good luck on the campaign trail. Thanks. It's been nice interviewing you. Thank you. It's been very nice to meet you. And we'll see you uh, around on, I think, Twitter is where I Twitter, met you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll see you there, Gregory. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.